And so really, we now want to look at those, and uh, we're going to have a presentation on future directions of research, and who better to give that than Professor Stuart Ralston from the University of Edinburgh, one of our uh, centres of excellence for Paget's disease, and as you have clearly appointed him, the incoming chair of the Paget Association, so uh, ideally placed to do this. Okay. So we look forward to your talk, Stuart. Thanks, Roger. Yeah, so um, yeah, I just want to talk about research in Pagets. I mean, I, I've been doing research into Pagets for a long time, uh, maybe 30, 35 years. And it, it, it's just been a, it, it's kind of my life's work, actually. And as you've heard, as you heard from Mike this morning, as you heard from Keith, um, there has not been enough good research in Pagets. All the bisphosphonate drugs that were used the only thing anyone ever looked at was alkaline phosphatase level. Not, not pain, not quality of life, not surgery, not, just alkaline phosphatase level. And that is not good enough. And uh, we're, we're trying to change that. So, you've heard about Sir James Paget. Um, I came on the scene a lot later. But um, when I started seeing patients with Pagets in Glasgow, um, it was a, a, a condition that fascinated me, and I was also you know, very concerned about the symptoms and disability that patients had. So um, it's quite a common <coughs> condition uh, in older people, about 1% of people in the UK. Uh, Britain is the world capital of Pagets. Um, that's because um, there's a genetic predisposition to Pagets in people of British descent. We, we carry genes that predispose us to Pagets. Um, I mean, there's various pictures there. This is a bone scan of someone with Pagets. It's affecting the femurs, the skull, the scapula, the spine, and the, the, um, the pelvis. The bones enlarge, and this might be a bone from Norton Priory, but the bone is enlarged because there's new bone formation. As Keith has mentioned, you can get fractures, and that was a patient of mine in Aberdeen, actually, when I was working in Aberdeen, and she just walking out the hairdressers, heard a crack and then fell down and just had a fracture just like that. <clears throat> and uh, the abnormality is, is what's called the bone remodeling process is abnormal. So in all of us all the time, our bones are being remodeled at a slow rate and it's all a very orderly process. In Paget's disease, for reasons that aren't completely understood, that just goes over time. So the bones start to remodel like double or triple the rate at which they should. And these cells here, called osteoblasts, they, they're working overtime. And the osteoblasts that make new bone, they're working overtime too. And, you know, so things get a bit chaotic, basically. There's lots of things that can happen. We heard about osteoarthritis. It can affect the skull, causing deafness. We've heard about fractures. But the most common symptom is pain, actually. So that's the usual thing patients come, come to you with. This was a, a, a study that I did with Adrian Tan, one of my trainees. Uh, he's now a consultant in the borders. We looked at patients that had been referred since I went to Edinburgh and set up the clinic, about 88 patients. And this was the symptoms. So 73% had pain. So that far and away the most common symptom. In some patients, they had a bent bone. Some had osteoarthritis, some had fractures. Um, most patients had symptoms, although about 20% of people didn't have any. And with increasing tests being done by doctors for all sorts of things, it is common to get that, or you get that. So a doctor does a blood test for some unrelated reason. The ALP is high, and they think, I wonder what that is. And it's Paget's disease. And a lot of these people don't have any problems. They may never get any problem. So, so about 20%, it's an incidental finding, as we call it. Um, <clears throat> now, a puzzle um, is, or not a puzzle, a question we're interested in, what causes pain in Pagets? And um, one of the kind of classic causes is what's called increased metabolic activity. And if I can explain that, I told you that the, the bone turnover was kind of going very, very fast in Pagets. And that can account for the pain. Um, and that's where drugs like pamidronate, Keith, which you had, zoledronate, resedronate, they can help that pain. But in fact, if we look at increased bone turnover and we measure that with this ALP, you'll all have heard of ALP. If you've got Paget, you'll have measured your alkaline, you'll have had your ALP measured. 
And actually, there's not a very good correlation between the level of bone turnover and pain. This was information from the PRISM study, which is a trial we did. And if you look at people with high ALP, so that's people with high bone turnover with activity, as we say, 55% um, of pain, 40% of no pain. So it was kind of itchy peachy. If you looked at people with normal ALP, no, they shouldn't be having pain if you've got badgets, but they do. About 55% of people have pain with normal ALP. And the answer is, is there's lots of causes of pain in Paget's, lots of causes. There's the metabolic activity, which responds well to bisphosphonates. And I think hearing your story, Keith, all of that bisphosphonate was, the doctor had not diagnosed you properly. It wasn't that, it was the osteoarthritis or the stress fracture. And I think that's where having a specialist that knows about Paget's is, is worthwhile. Because if there's an endocrinologist, endocrinologists love treating hormone levels and stuff like that. They're great at doing that, but they're not so good at looking at the patient. And if only you'd been referred to a rheumatologist like me. Anyway, so related to Paget's, you've got the metabolic activity, but if your bone is bent, that probably causes pain. If you've got OA, that causes pain. If you've got a fracture, a stress fracture. If you've got the disease in your spine causing stenosis of the spine, getting a nerve compressed, all of that can cause pain related to Paget's. But you've got a whole lot of other stuff unrelated to Paget's that can cause pain. You can have a degenerative disc. You can have OA that's not related to Paget's, fractures not related to Paget's, and so on and so forth. So I'm just showing this to just illustrate the complexity. And, and that's why I think, I think one of the things, that, it's hard for GPs to sort this out. And I think probably if you've got, been diagnosed with Paget's, it's kind of quite good if you get referred to a specialist, because they're going to be finding out what's the cause of the pain and what is the right treatment. A little anecdote, actually, of a patient I got referred just, not yesterday, but last week, and um, he'd been admitted to the medicine of the elderly ward, and he said, we've got this pain, what's the patient with pain? Uh, he's got Paget's, the ALP is like 150, should we give him Zaledronate? And I said, well, 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 hang on a wee minute, hang on a wee minute. I, I can see him this afternoon in my clinic. So he sent him down to the clinic. I saw him, where's the pain, where's the pain? It's in my right hip, doc, it's in my right hip. And then I looked at his x-rays. His Paget's disease was in the left hip. He had osteoarthritis in the right hip. <laughs> and I said, you could give him selegionate, but it's not going to help. You know, it'll give him the flu. But, and so it's, it's kind of really just, it's a bit of a no-brainer, you know, but... Assessing the patient. Now, um, Roger mentioned this, the pain in the Paget's disease study. Uh, we're calling it the PIP study. That's our little logo there. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you have seen Lord of the Rings, but that might, the little eye in PIP might be a little bit uh, reminiscent of that. I've kind of stolen that. Uh, and it's to illustrate the, the fieriness that the pain can have. So that's the PIP study. And what we're doing in the PIP study is trying to just define the causes of pain, like taking people, coming to the clinics, and thinking, well, what, what, what do we think the cause of the pain is? Is it a fracture, is it a stress fracture, is it OA, is it metabolic activity? And we'll also be looking at how the pain has responded to previous treatment. <clears throat> um, we're doing a thing which I'm not so familiar with, but one of the applicants uh, in the team is a pain kind of specialist doctor. And we're going to do quantitative sensory testing, that's called. It's an interesting thing. So it turns out that many people who have pain, especially if they have chronic pain, it can affect the way that they actually perceive pain. It can, be, it can almost like be a, a kind of self-worsening um, thing. So your pain pathways are getting stimulated, and that actually can cause more pain. So that's a way of assessing that. Um, you get these little brushes that you that you can put on the patient where the pain the patient has it, and you do it on the other side. So we're going to be doing that. And then we're going to be doing these other things. <clears throat> these are what's called hot and cold rollers. And they fix to this machine, and you put, the, you put the hot roller on the patient's painful side, and say, can you hear that? Is that? Can you feel that? Is that cold? Is it hot? And you, you, kind of, you, you, know, you look at the pain perception. So we're going to be doing that. And the aim of that study is to try and you know, improve management, give doctors a hint about, you know, well, actually, 
It could be Paget's metabolic activity, but think about osteoarthritis or this or the other. So that's the idea of it. <coughs> Where we are with this, um, we've written what's called the protocol. So whenever you're doing a study, you need to write a protocol. That's a description of exactly what you're going to do. You need to write the patient information leaflet, and we've done that too. And we've done what's called, we've designed what's called a database. And that's when we get the data so that we can store it. So that's all done. That's quite a lot of work, actually. And um, at the moment, we have just sent it to what's called a sponsor. In, our, uh, in any hospital or any academic institution, if you're doing a trial, a clinical trial, a clinical study, you've got to have a sponsor. So our sponsor is NHS Lothian and the university. And so what they do is they look at your protocol, they look at your information leaflet, and they say, yeah, well, we this is fine, or you need to add this. So they are looking at that at the moment, and we hope to submit it for ethics, and we hope by November, well, towards the last part of this year, we hope to start recruitment, hopefully starting in the Paget Centre of Excellence. So, you know, some of you may be asked to take part in this, and it's not involved taking any drugs, it's just asking you things and maybe doing the little brushes and the hot and cold rollers on you. So that's the PIP study. And that's going to last about two and a half, three years. <coughs> So watch this space. I hope we will understand more about the cause of pain in Paget's, how often it responds to bisphosphonates, and when it doesn't, and why it doesn't. <clears throat> the other thing uh, that I've been involved in for a long time is genes and Paget's or genetics. Roger, you mentioned Dr. Omar Albaga's study. We have just um, finished that study. We haven't finished analysing it, but we've done all the genotyping, and we expect to have more information. Now, what about genes and Pagets? Why, you know, why, why do we think genetics are important? Well, it's shown in this slide. If you take people with Pagets and then you say, anyone else in the family have Pagets? Often you get, well, yeah, my uncle had it or, you know, my father had it. And it depends where you are in the world. In, in Spain, Pagets is quite a common condition. And in a certain region of Spain, up to 40% of people have a family history. Very, very strong. There's a, a certain sub-region of Spain. In Britain, it's about 15%. In Holland, it's about 5%. So family history varies. <clears throat> I actually visited the part of Spain where they had this, it's a very high prevalence of pageants. And it turned out that, that in the something like, in the 17th century, a bunch of British architects and artisans had visited that region of Spain to build a church. And one suspects that they may have taken their, their genes with them, if you, see, if you get my drift, okay? So that's probably why Pagets is so common in this region of Spain. Anyway, <clears throat> so if you do have uh, Pagets, or if your father has Pagets, or your mother has Pagets, then someone like, I don't have a history of Paget's, but if you do, then you have a seven times increased risk of getting it yourself. So, so if you have children, they will have an increased risk of Paget's, and we're trying to find out what the genes are, what the genetic <coughs> variants are that predispose to that. Um, here are the genes that we know about, 13 genes that predispose to Paget's. What, what this is in the bottom is the chromosomes, well, we all have 23 chromosomes, one, two, three, four, da, 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 da. And there's genes for Paget's and on a lot of these chromosomes, there are 13 genes. And I was emailing Omar, who was funded by the association to do this study, and we think we may have discovered another five genes, not, not, not yet replicated. So it looks like that study will yield results. <clears throat> now, what we found is, from looking at these genes and what they do, and this maybe isn't such a surprise. The gene variants that predispose to Paget's, they are in genes that regulate bone-resorbing re bone cells. So the bone-resorbing cells are called osteoclasts. Those are the cells that are digging up the bone. And it turns out that a lot of the genes which predispose to Paget's have a role in the osteoclast. So, so probably what happens is if you inherit a variant that's predisposing, it kind of racks up your osteoclast so it's more likely to to be overactive. And uh, there's more to this story yet. <clears throat> now, the other thing that we, all, that we all know, at least doctors and scientists working in the field know, is that environmental factors are important. Um, because Paget's has become less common over, say, the past 25, 30 years. And so something's going on, but we're not exactly sure what it is. Now, 
there's been a few um, suggested environmental factors. One is measles virus, been a lot of research on that, and also another virus related called respiratory syncytial virus that causes a type of bronchitis in kids. <clears throat> the stemper virus, that was raised for a bit, but then there was an association one study, but then other studies didn't show it. So in, in general, um, the research into viruses has been rather conflicting. I would say it, it's not proven. It was suggested that Padgett's might be due to exposure to environmental toxins, you know, like arsenic, stuff like this. There is a thought that it may be due to um, poor nutrition. Now, um, everyone heard of rickets? Yeah, I mean, that was very, very prevalent in you know, the earlier part of the century. You hardly ever see it now. We know that vitamin D deficiency is important in rickets, and it may be that the reductions we've seen are, are simply due to nutrition, improvements in nutrition. The other thing that has been suggested is maybe if you have had a fracture in a bone in a younger day or you've been overusing that bone, maybe that predisposes. So there's a lot of things. <clears throat> Although one thing that we're going to be we're looking at now in a grant that I've just been awarded is the microbiome. Okay? And you're thinking, well, what the hell is the microbiome? Well, I'm going to tell you. We all have what's called a microbiome. And it's a scary thought, but all of us have in our gut, in our skin, in our mouth, these microbes. One trillion of them, okay? <laughs> so as you sit there just now, you have a trillion bugs, microbes. All of, it's scary, isn't it? And it weighs apparently two kilograms. Now that is, that, that kind of blows your mind, but that's absolutely true. And what we know, there's been, this is an area that a lot of researchers are interested in doing. We know the microbiome is important for your health. So see if you have antibiotics, that knocks out your microbiome and it can lay you open to certain types of infection. You all have seen stuff like Yakal and all these like yogurt things. That's trying to give you good microbiome. So it's very important. And there's evidence that the microbiome is important for your bones. It's not been studied in Padgett's, but we're going to be studying it. <clears throat> and what we're interested in doing is looking at uh, the role of genetics and the microbiome and people's diet. <clears throat> in, in this grant, which I just got in before breakfast, I, I, I was awarded early in the year by the European Commission. They have this framework called Horizon 2020. And I feel as though I was quite fortunate, but um, I put in a submission to, this, to the EU. It was funded and it's called Paget Advance. Um, and the idea is to advance knowledge in Paget's. 2.44 million euros. That's a shed load of money. Even better now that the pound has gone downhill. It's worth more. Well, in pounds. And it start, it's just started in August. And it's going to go till 2023 if I'm spared. Now, one of the things we're doing as part of this grant is getting kids of people with Padgett's, like yourself, if you suffer from Padgett's. We want to offer those kids, above the age of 40, of course, a screen to see if they've got Padgett's on a scan and blood tests. We're going to look at genetic markers, look at the microbiome, and try and figure out if we can predict. Because what I think is, is impressed me about seeing people with Padgett's, often the diagnosis is missed for years and years and years. And people have Padgett's, they don't know it. And if it gets to an advanced stage, it very, it's impossible to wind that back. So you want to get in early. So that's that. So just to wind up on a study we're doing now, um, it's called the ZIP study, and it addresses the question about can we prevent Padgett's? It's called PDB here, Padgett's disease of bone. <clears throat> and so this study started in 2010, and what we did is we took people at Padgett's, um, a family history of Padgett's, sorry, and we tested them for one of the genes. <clears throat> and the gene we tested for is this one, SQSTM1, or sequestosome 1. And we know that people that have this gene variant or this gene are at, high, are at risk of getting Padgett's as they go through life. So we randomised the people that tested positive. We gave half of them zoledronic acid, which you've heard about. And we gave half of them a dummy treatment. And the patients and the doctors, we don't know who had what. Um, we have a clue because a lot of the people got quite side effects. So there's an inkling that we know what they've got. But anyway... I don't know what they've got. Uh, the people in the centres may have uh, 
had a guess. And what we're uh, looking at is can the zoledronic acid stop the evolution of Paget's? Um, I, I don't have any results yet because we're doing the end of trial visits next year, 2019. We'll have the results in 2020. <coughs> but these are some results from the ZIP study. And Keith Charnock, you're on the TSC for this. Thank you. <coughs> and so we, we enrolled men and women. There were slightly more women. So 46% were men, 54% women that took part in the study. The average age was about 50. <coughs> And what we found, we did bone scans in everyone, and we found that about 14% had, had signs of very, very early Pagets in, on bone scan. Absolutely no one had any symptoms. No one had any pain, and it was really, really very early uh, uh, disease, if you like. And of course, we don't know if this is going to be harmful or not, but anyway, that's what we found. Two things we found. We found uh, early Pagets was more common in men, that wasn't a surprise because we know Paget's is more common in men. The men get it about, the ratio of men to women is about 1.4 to 1, so we, that was known for a while. And the other thing that um, made a difference, so these lesions, so this is early Paget's. So people that had early Paget's, they were a little bit older than those that didn't. They were about five years older. So we have to see what's going to happen. It will be very interesting to see what pans out. As I say, patients got side effects. Are we going to prevent the evolution? We don't know. <clears throat> so that was the, the, uh, the recruitment graph into the ZIP study. It started in 2010. <clears throat> this is like every researcher's nightmare. You start, you're all a few patients, and then nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. You're writing your suicide note, and then suddenly it takes off. And so we have 220 patients in the study. And... Uh, and actually, the other thing we're going to do, and it's helped by the EU study, is we're going to do an extension until 2023. So we're going to continue to follow those patients up. And that will be tremendously interesting. And uh, in 2020, uh, I will be able to tell you the headline results. Now, to come back to Mike Stone's pre uh, presentation, and, and Keith has touched on this again, one of the things that the guideline told us is that we really don't know enough about Paget's disease. And in, when, you, when you do a guideline, you know, you t you're tending to think, well, maybe you should advise this, maybe you should advise that, maybe you should advise the other, without really knowing what the right thing to do was. And in the guideline, we decided, well, if we really don't know what the right thing to do is, then let's just say it. We do not know what the right thing to do is. And so we don't know if you should treat people who don't have any symptoms. They may never have symptoms. We don't know if treatment prevents complications. We could do with a little more about knowing about genetics. We do a lot more about knowing about joint replacement surgery. If I were to summarize, I think there is a lot of research going on at the moment. That's great. Some of it, uh, important parts of it, uh, funded by the Paget Association. But there's still a lot to do, and the guideline told us that. I think pain is a, a big issue, and, and I'm so glad that the association have, have, have supported that. Um, my feeling is that we want to focus on earlier diagnosis and, and, and try and get a way to, if, if you had, your father had Paget, so you had a relative, try and get a blood test that can tell you, well, yeah, you should have closer surveillance. Maybe not necessarily treatment very early, but certainly closer surveillance. And, um, and the ZIP study will, will tell us about the risks and benefits of treatment in, in very early disease. Because it sounds good, if you get no symptoms, maybe you should have treatment, but maybe you shouldn't. And so we're, we're trying to find that out through ZIP. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to take questions uh, if there are. That's research and pageants. Thank you very much, Stuart. Right, that, that was inspiring. Thank it's you. great that you're doing so much good work Thank in Edinburgh. It's really much. good. Thank you. Any questions for Stuart? Oh, yeah. Sorry, yes. Mr Simpson. Pain keeps coming into the equation in everything really. And, and here we all, if we've had bad years, we've probably suffered with pain. But we all identify pain differently. Mm -hmm. Neurotic, neurotic, uh, yeah, okay, in the brain. Yes. <laughs> Does the brain have some one centre that registers pain? And if it does, surely isn't that the way to sort of look at pain 
rather than brushing your thigh with a hot roller or something like well, that. Well, with all due respect, Keith, well, first of all, you are right. The brain, the nervous system at several levels, that is important in processing pain and detecting it. Those brushes in the hot and cold, th that is a way of trying to assess how the brain is detecting, not so much pain, but detecting sensory inputs. And um, yeah, the brain is very important. And, and by doing those tests, we will get an idea if people who have pain, if there is an issue with their processing, if they're different from people who don't have pain, or if it's not that, if it's just down to high bone turnover or if it's down to osteoarthritis. So I think finding that out uh, is useful. And, and it can give a steer of what treatments to use. Like you mentioned you were in tramadol. Some of the other treatments doctors use are, are treatments that interfere with transmission of pain signals, like amitriptyline is one or gabapentin is one. I don't know if anyone's had any of those. So that is a, another way of dealing with it. So, but I think, yeah, we could... There's a lot of research that's been done outside Pagets on exactly those brain processing mechanisms, but uh, not in Pagets. And this is just a first step, actually. Yes. I was just wondering, um, do you know of any research done inside of particular location of where a bone is likely to fracture? And is it worth assessing um, if there's a specific point, for example, in the femur that's more likely to fracture? If you could do that. Yeah. If you look at Pagets, the two common sites of fracture, one is the lateral femur, exactly in that beautiful x-ray you saw. Um, <clears throat> that is a common site of fracture. The other site of fracture is the tibia. So, um, so those are the sites that common fracture. So, so if you've got Pagets, if you've got it in those sites, then you know, those are the kind of risk sites. Other sites very rarely fracture. If you see one of those what's called pseudo fractures, and again, Keith's x-ray is a very good example of a pseudo-fracture, then there could be more research done to figure out what you should do. Should you fix it and plate it? Should you wait and see? And, and those pseudo-fractures, that is an area where there could be more research. Just anecdotally, some of them, there's no pain, nothing happens, they stay the same for years. Others, like my lady that walked out of the hairdresser, she suffered a clean fracture with it, with no trauma and then others were, will heal. So we don't know so much about the, the natural history, so to speak, of those fractures. But the lateral border of the femur, that carries the mo the upper part of the femur, that's where the most stress goes in your body. Remember when we were doing those exercises this morning? Well, that, that's the maximum area of stress. So it's easy to see why the fractures occur there. Okay, I hope that answers your question.